So, Olivia Coffey, double world champion, American Oswoman extraordinaire, boat race winner as well, uh, coronavirus sufferer, uh, MBA, Harvard alumnus. Uh, you know, there's loads of things one could say about you, Olivia, but I'm so pleased that I'm able to join you on this Crosses Corner chat. And uh, it's great to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Just one slight correction. It's three world championships. Oh, besides that, all I forgot the four in 2013. In 2013 in Chengdu. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, ne never to be forgotten. Okay. So um, people are joining us as we talk. And um, I'm sure they'll... Uh, those numbers will carry on going up. But if you've got any questions, just post them on the chat and uh, I'm sure we can integrate them into, into what we talk about. So, Olivia, you look very well and healthy now, but uh, that wasn't the case uh, a couple of months ago. No, that's correct. Right now I'm doing great. Um, end of March, not, not quite as well. I came down with um, the coronavirus. Um, and it lasted probably for about five to six weeks, but I am back in the swing of things and feeling really good. How, how was it when you got it? I mean, were you worried or scared at all, or did you know what you had? Um, it was it was a really challenging time because it all happened when the Olympic postponement was occurring. So we were continuing to train, even though uh, our our team meetings had been broken up. So we were training individually with the assumption that the Olympics were still continuing. This was probably on a, a Saturday. So I, I noticed that I was having a really hard time motivating on individual workouts, which typically isn't the case for me. And I would say Saturday, I kind of put myself into a hole on a hard workout. It went well. And then, you know, Monday and Tuesday rolled around. We had Canada pulling out and Australia pulling out and just kind of, overwhelmed with with what was happening at the when we consider the games but then when I think about physically how I was feeling I thought it was tied to the mental bit but looking back at it it was it was a combination of the two and I think um, if I had known that I was falling ill with corona I think it would have made it a little bit easier but um, yeah it was a t it was a tough time for everyone and then you had corona on top of that and it makes it just that much more challenging. I know you, you must have told lots of people, but um, what, what kind of symptoms did you have when you, you, you know, in the, in the middle of that week when you realised it might be something else other than just uh, the blues about the Olympics being postponed? Yeah, the first thing I noticed was, um, I, I, like I said, lack of motivation for working out. And then I, I took my temperature because I just was feeling icky and achy. And I noticed it was mid 99s, which is unusual for me. So that was the first acute symptom. And then a few days later, my sense of smell went away. Um, and then just total absolute fatigue. Um, and the loss of sense of smell probably lasted for two weeks. And then the fatigue, uh, and, and I would say the, the fever was a week, but the fatigue lasted for, for five to six weeks. Whoa. And, and fortunately, Fortunately, though, I should mention I had no respiratory problems, which was a, a major symptom for a lot of people in the U.S. So I was fortunate in that regard. Now, I, I know you live there with your partner, Mike, but did the, the, I guess the two of you had to isolate. Is that something that uh, is mandatory in the States? Yeah. So as soon as I found out that I had it, um, we had actually just got a place near my family in upstate New York. We just happened to have purchased it a few months prior. So we were able to come up here and completely isolate for, I think we did it for four weeks. Um, and so, you know, my parents would come by and drop food off at the top of the driveway. I would wave at them and then they drive away and I would go pick it up. So that was kind of our, our MO for four weeks. And I, I guess talking to you, you look, you look really healthy now, but there must have been really difficult to gauge when you could start going back to training or, you know, because this this is a virus that, you know, doesn't just sort of appear for a couple of weeks and then disappear. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because you go from being in the best shape of your life and you can see, see it slowly start to fall away um, and you're trying to hang on to it as best you can. But then I think I had the realization that this is like a marathon and it's okay to 
feel like, you know, you're taking a break from training for a bit. Um, I wish that I had stayed away a little bit longer. I think that that would have shortened my recovery period. Um, but once I realized that there was no pressure to come back or try to achieve what I had only a few weeks prior, um, I was able to slow down and kind of listen to what my body was doing. And I yeah. think because of that, ramp up yeah. the past few weeks. So, so percentage wise, what, what would you say you're, you're back to at the moment in terms of if, you know, 100% is you've got all of your um, abilities to train? What, what are you at at the moment? I'm 100%. I can train. Oh, wow. uh, I'm just fast right now. <laughs> so like, you know, I couldn't be, I couldn't be uh, super successful in an Olympic year program, say if it were like March, but um, here we are, we're 13 months out from the Olympics and I can... I think successfully complete the training that we have to do. I, I'm not as fast as I want to be right now, but that's okay. I'm getting the work in and I'm just going to chip away at it. <laughs> I, I did see somewhere, Olivia, that you, you were, you know, definite that you were going to commit, you know, with the postponement for another year, but, you know, just listening to you talk now, it sounds like that's a done deal. Yeah, I think that that was residual for being sick. You know, you, you can't really wrap your mind around another 16 months of training. I felt that the training that I was doing, the lifestyle I was leading was unsustainable for another year. But now that we kind of have visibility on the Olympic postponement, we have really clear communication from our coaches about what our expectations are for the next few months. Um, you know, I'm able to figure out how the pieces start to fit together again. And I wasn't able to do that before. And like, we, you know, I'm 31 years old. I'll be 32 next year. What's another year? What's another year of training? <laughs> but, you, but you sounded, you, you know, that um, that sort of training that you've been through, I mean, it must have been extremely intense. Um and, you know, some athletes have taken that decision to postpone the Olympics quite differently. I think Mahe Drysdale in New Zealand, you know, it really demotivated him. I, he wrote a very powerful blog on that. And uh, it sounds like that was a similar situation for you because of all the effort you put in in this Olympic uh, year. Yeah, you know, I actually I read that blog that he wrote a few days after he wrote it. And I just thought he did such a good job because it was so incredibly clear in it it really mirrored my, um, my feelings at the time. But I think, I think that if you're training for the Olympics properly, it's not a program that you want to stay on for another year, right? So it means if you don't want to keep doing it, you're probably doing it really, really well. Um, and I think that the lack of motivation, I think you talked about going for out for a bike ride and just stopping and turning around after a few minutes. Yeah. I think, I think that's right. Like, I think when you can't find that motivation to keep going on, that's your body telling you, let's take a break right now and let's recoup. Let's refocus and figure out exactly how we want to tackle it. And you, after training for the Olympics or having training in an Olympic year or twice now, you can't expect to get faster next year if you don't ease back right now. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I talked with Ollie Cook, who's one of the British four, and he was in the Rio um, sort of squad. He didn't make the team. Um, but his impression was there was even much more intensity in the Tokyo Olympiad, and particularly this last year, it, compared to the selection for the Rio process. So he, he found it because he was, he's been selected in the – he was selected in the four again. So I think he found it particularly frustrating after all that effort being put in you know and and the intensity of the selection process so did you do you notice any difference between you know what happened in the lead up to Rio and the lead up to Tokyo before it the, the squad stopped training well I think there's like one main difference between the British team and the U.S. team and that the British team selects their crews well in advance of the U.S. team and so we haven't been we haven't been through selection yet um, we were still just kind of in that winter training mode, lots of miles, lots of base. Um, and so we wouldn't, at the time the Olympics were postponed, we hadn't gone through that selection. So I think that our situation was very different from the British team since they had really named their team. That's probably the most stressful point. Um, the 2016 Olympiad, 
for the U.S. team was very stressful. Everyone was very talented. Um, I, it's, you know, a completely different job this time around. I think that um, if you had given a few, few more months, if the postponement had happened later, it would have been equally as stressful. Yeah. So in Tom Tahar's legendary setup, I mean, how do you how do you cope with a training program as intense as that where, you know, you've got how many women, something around 25, 30 women training, intensely competing against each other? How, how does someone like yourself fit into that kind of program? Yeah, so we have, I would say, 30 or 35 women um, at our training center. We have sweep and sculling. So from our camp, they're going to select the eight, the quad, and the four. Um, it is a very competitive environment. It is um, full of high caliber athletes. So every day you've got the best people in the world pushing you, which is awesome. But I think it's taken me a while to realize that not every day is a selection day. Um, and your job when you're part of the training center is to use the facilities, use the people to make yourself faster, but only feel like you have to perform a few times a year. Um, and I think when I initially started training every day, I was like, ah, this is the day I'm going to get really, really fast. And I would just go hard all the time. And eventually it would just, I would get worn out. Um, but it is like a, it's a great setup and it's a system that's worked incredibly well for well over a decade. Um, so I'm, I feel really lucky that we have that in the U.S. Yeah, I, I saw something which, you know, when we'll talk about you going to Cambridge a, a little bit later, but, you know, when you had the experience of uh, going to Cambridge, that you came back with a fresh perspective on the U.S. system, you know, the, the type of training. Um, that uh, the the need to be intense on every session and and I guess there was something around the the way that you rode as well at Cambridge compared to the way the US women rode. So what what about the differences? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, you know, I rode in high school. I went on and I rode at Harvard, and then I joined the national team. And from basically 2012 through 2016, that was my only. Um, environment for rowing. And I think that any rower who's been in a system for a few years really benefits from taking a break and stepping outside to a completely different environment. And, you know, we're doing the same sport, but it's completely different in the UK versus the US. And, you know, the coaches talk about the stroke differently. I mean, I went there and I was like, I've, I've never even thought about taking a stroke in this manner. Yeah. Um, and so that super helpful. And I think when I combined my experience from the U S and then I've got all this great influence from the coaching at Cambridge and the athletes at Cambridge and that whole system, I felt like I was a more complete rower and I had a lot more confidence in my ability to make boats go fast. So when I came back to the U S system, I had a clearer understanding of what a good stroke is. Um, and I could combine that with the intensity and the, the physiological aspects that um, are kind of hallmarks of the U.S. program. Yeah. What Can you be specific about how things were a bit different at Cambridge or how they explained the stroke differently? What What was all that about? Yeah. So essentially, like when you're at Cambridge, you don't have the same amount of time for, to train for rowing. So essentially my days with the MBA program is, as, you know, you wake up at 4.45, you get on the train at 5.30, 5.45, you've trained, go to class from 9 to 5, and then you train from 5.30 to 7, do your homework, go to bed at 10 or 11, and then just repeat that for about a year. And then, so you get really efficient at training. Um, and so you can't do these long, low, vol or high volume, low intensity sessions like you do on a national team. Everything is really, really hard, um, high intensity, uh, very scientific. We took lactates when we do steady state, and it actually really benefited me. And I I hit like a PR on my 5K three months after joining the training program. So it made me realize that I can be successful uh, training in a completely different way than I had been on the US team. And that both methods work and they both have, they have value. And I could kind of merge those together when I came back. When you talk about the rowing stroke, um, <laughs> that I had a lot to work on when I got there. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I did. Why? <laughs> you could just ask. 
<laughs> ask Rob Baker. <laughs> um, so I think the, the most important thing I learned was how to be long uh, through the water. And I think I yet, Rob yelled at me maybe in the fall at some time. It's not how, how hard you can get or You know, it's not how fast you can get the blade through the water. It's how long you can be through the water. And that, that really resonated with me. And I think we had um, Robin Williams come out for a few days with our team. And yeah. that was like such a treat because he's just uh, he's like a wizard, you know, he's, he knows everything. And he shows you videos of things totally unrelated to rowing, but talks about how these movements are similar. And he just tries to make you think about the stroke in a different way. And so that was really helpful. Um, so length was a big part of it. And then making sure that I, I, I work down below. I have a tendency to get up in my shoulders because my upper body is the strong, my strong part. I, you yeah. know, I don't have super strong legs. And so it took me a while to realize that it's, it's a hang and, and swing kind of rhythm, not a grip and a grip and pull. That's, that's, that's really interesting. And, and you talked a little bit about that schedule at Cambridge. I gather one of your professors thought that what you were doing was impossible. Yeah, I had some guy come up to me, professor, and said, ah, oh, you know, we had a few men who wanted to do the Cambridge Run program, but, you know, we just told them it, it wasn't possible. And the women's program has to be easier, right? There's no way you can do it. And I was like, oh, that's not the case at all, actually. <laughs> it's just really hard. Uh, but, yeah, no, they, they uh, the good thing about the women's program is that they train in the mornings on the water. So it makes having the MBA program um it's much more achievable. Um, and when um, I committed to going to school there, I, I said, school is my priority and that's my number one and I'm not going to yeah. miss any classes to go to any rowing event. And so um, I was able to do that successfully And the business school was um, I super supportive. The rowing program was super supportive. And so it ended up working really well. And I can't imagine that it would have been the case anywhere else. That's really interesting. I, I guess, though, you know, um, that there must have been times in the year where you really struggled because that intensity is just like phenomenal. And you must have struggled at some time to combine your studies for the MBA with your training for the boat race. Yeah, I mean, it was it was tough. I think it was like, you know, coming into December and I was just totally sleep deprived and I was counting down the days till I could go home and just sleep because you get to the weekend and you don't really have a day off. You have to train Saturday and Sunday when you're at Cambridge because um, those are the big mile days. And so um, when I did get the opportunity to sleep, I was sleeping 12 to 13 hours a night, but Whoa. usually at alarm for less than seven hours, I was really struggling the next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and your partner, Mike famously rode for the dark blues, I think in 2005, and he had no problems with you going to be a light blue for Cambridge. <laughs> We're a house divided. Okay. So <laughs> he, I think at the, at the boat race, he, um, he wouldn't wear tab green is what he said. So he got a, a Navy blue shirt that just said, go live. And that's as far as he would go for supporting <laughs> I've never heard him say go Cambridge and it's funny we've got our up here oh yeah so there's my Cambridge or oh wow and the Oxford or so we represent both the light and the so cool. blues, which makes uh, really interesting so um I want to talk a, a little bit about your own career um you came through the under 23 system and then um early on in the Olympic cycle, you got selected in that four for 2013 for the World Championships. So how did that feel coming into the national team being selected for that crew? Um, uh, yeah, so I'd been on three U23 teams and I knew that that was something, going on to the national team was something I always really wanted to do. And so making your first national team is one of the most exciting times ever as a rower, uh, I think for any rower. And so I think the flight to Chengju was 16 hours from New York and I didn't the whole time. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like super nervous too, um, cause you want to do well, but yeah, I mean, Chengju was like an awesome facility, uh, where we stayed was, was pretty cool. And then, um, we had a really talented crew that year. Felice Mueller struck the boat. Tessa Gobo was in it. And, uh, 
Emily Hills camp and we're all still, well, Testa is retired, but we're all still training. And so that was a successful crew. We were fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And can you remember the feeling crossing the line? Your first senior gold medal? Honestly, no. I, I, <laughs> I just remember, uh, I remember about midway through the race, I was in the two seat and I was calling it and I looked to the side and I saw that we were up and I could see our coach, Rob Weber. And I just thought, you better not mess this up. <laughs> that, that was the extent of what I remember. Besides like the racing, I it was kind of like the atmosphere of the first world championships. You know, you see like the famous rowers and it's your first time being there. And it's just pretty overwhelming. And Who was like feel- famous that you remember seeing then? Who were the famous rowers that you can recall? Oh, Kim Crow. Um, oh, well, yeah. I think Felice and I got our picture with uh, Eric Murray. Yeah, um, yeah. Those are our superstars at the time. And obviously the British women's pair, that was cool to see. I mean, you you follow all these people throughout college and then to see them in real life. First of all, you think, oh my God, they're way bigger than I thought they would be. They're all <laughs> huge. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's just really special. Yeah. And, and then the, the following year, one thing that I've, be interested to understand is how come you got into a sculling into the sculling squad from being a sweep athlete because you rode sweep all the time in the under 23s yep. and then and then you were in um into a sculling squad in 2014 how did that happen or why so as part of the 2016 quad everybody was sweeping and sculling because the priority of boats went uh pair eight quad um than the sweep four. So uh, anyone at any time could be sculling. So we would go out, I think we could go out in eights, we could go out in fours, we could go out quads. You were just expected to be able to switch back and forth. Um, I just happened to end up in the quad in 2014 because that's kind of where I stacked up next to everybody else who was at the camp. So I had no experience sculling and um, you can imagine how scary it is trying to race a sculling boat at a world championships when you have no experience racing a sculling boat. That's uh, a little overwhelming. I mean, you're trying to figure out how you even feather the blades kind of thing. (laughs) So yeah, it was hard. And you came away with a a bronze medal from that, that championships in Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, that I was really proud of that bronze medal um, because that crew, none of us had sculled. You, again, Felice was stroking the boat. I was three. Tracy Iser, who obviously is a powerhouse now, and then we had Grace Lacks yeah. with the most sculling experience. And so we were all just very young. Um, it was Tracy and Grace's first national team, and we got bronze. But it, you know, I think that we approached the regatta really well. And for young athletes, I don't know if you remember this, but all the lanes got switched right before yeah. the race of the quads. And yeah. fours came through, they did start, and then we went. And I think given the conditions and given our experience, what bronze was really, really good. And I um I didn't really I don't really think of myself as a sculler, but it's nice to win a world championship medal on a sculling boat. <laughs> so that was fun. So you you you're in the middle of the Olympic cycle, I and mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, talk with Ollie Zeidler a, a couple of weeks back, and um, his his dad was a rower, his grandfather was an Olympic champion rower, and of course um, your father Calvin is an Olympic medalist, and I just wonder what influence that had on you, and as a sportswoman, as an athlete, um, and in the you know the middle of that Olympic cycle. Yeah, well, actually, both both of my parents were rowers. My dad has an Olympic silver medal on the pair. He and his partner, Mike Staines, got second to the East Germans in 76. Um, and so one thing I've always really prided myself on as a rower is the ability to perform really well when the pressure is on. I'm not, I'm not great at training. Um, anybody will tell you that. Like, I, you know, I kind of struggle through training. I'm not really... Uh, a high volume kind of athlete, but when race day comes at a world championship, I'm, I'm on and I'm yeah. going to be faster than I've been on that day. And I think that's something my dad and my mom have always really emphasized. It's just like, you got to perform when it counts. I think my dad always says I'm at least two lengths faster on race day. 
So. <laughs> Maybe I am too. I don't know. Who are you more like, your mum or your dad, Olivia? Uh, depends what part of me you're talking about. I think. Yeah, go on, then. You know, my physical appearance is much, I mean, I look identical to my dad. He's super powerful. Um, I'm really powerful. Uh, I think um, I have more of a person, the personality of my mom. Um, she's like ultra, ultra competitive, very high performing. Uh, you've got her MBA. She's a doctor, all these things. That's kind of who I, you know, I, I want to be like her. Uh, but yeah. physically, I, I got my dad's power and hopefully a little bit of my mom's engine. It's, it's kind of interesting that you, you know, you're together with Mike and both of you are rowers and uh, your mum and your dad were both rowers and together and you're kind of carrying on a dynasty a little bit like there. Yeah, it wasn't intentional. I just hang out with a lot of rowers. So, you know, I don't see it many other people. I think I met Michael in the new old boathouse parking lot one day. So, yeah, just just where you are. <laughs> so um, in 20. Uh, 15 there was it was the uh, sort of regatta to qualify for the olympic games in rio so it's a pretty important regatta i remember that being um i think the most tense championships i'd ever been at um you know just as a commentator you could feel when things didn't go right in the heat for some of the favorites and um you know the repechage races to get into the last 12 were was so cutthroat it was um a really really tense championships what what are your memories i'm going to talk through the race in in just a moment but what are your memories of of you know coming into that regatta yeah i mean coming into the regatta i actually didn't make the quad i was cut from the quad um I didn't so know that. If you, yeah i was cut from the quad that year uh and i was in the four and unfortunately adrian martelli in the build-up to the to the race that summer broke her rib. And so the coaches selected me to step in and take her spot. So I had been training with the crew. I, I, I can't remember, but it was a few weeks before the world championships. Um, and then I think we had a training camp in Italy and we were still switching the lineup around. So nothing was like super set. So I'd never stroked a boat before. I'd never stroked and sculled at the same time. Um, and I was new to the lineup. So yeah, like there was a lot of pressure. And then I was thinking like, I don't even deserve to be here right now. So like, if I screw this up, everyone's going to play me. <laughs> so Actually, yeah, there was a lot of pressure. You know, I had, uh, I think that's one of the things of, um, I, I, I spoke once with a Canadian oarswoman, her name was Shannon Crawford, and, and she was kind of the alternate um, for the Olympic team in 1992. And um, Jenny Dewey, I think she then was, got injured and uh, Shannon Crawford had to go into the boat and she kind of thought that she didn't really belong. Uh, they ended up winning a gold medal and she found it, I think, you know, is this really mine? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I don't think I, I felt like I really contributed to that result that summer and I don't think that I felt like I didn't deserve to be there um because i put in the work and when you're training with the national team anytime you train you're constantly trying to show the coaches why you're the right one to go in the boat and anytime they don't pick you you want to show well you made a mistake and every time they pick you you want to tell them yeah that was the right choice and so you constantly have to believe that you're the right person to be in the seat yeah and so any opportunity that you have to be there you have to prove to them why they made the right choice um and so it wasn't like i I felt that it 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 wasn't my result because I had worked really hard for it. It was just the pressure going into that situation was so high. Um, and I felt that not being selected for the boat initially made the, me feel that the coaches didn't have confidence in my abilities, even though I, I definitely did. Yeah. Um, and so I was out there and I was like, you're going to see that I'm the right person for this job. And so, um, well, let's, it took, let's it took, yeah. <laughs> Let's see how much you remember about that race. I'm going to try and um, try and take you through some of the uh, the memories. I don't know if is that. Can you see you sitting on the start there? 
That's me. Okay, so there's, you know, just the start. The call over is just starting. I mean, what are your memories of that particular time of the race, if you have any at all? Um, I do remember it very, very well. Um, I think in the build-up, so, you know, I think we had the heats, uh, the reps in the semis prior to this, or maybe just heats and reps. Um, but I just remember we had not won any of those races. We had come in uh, second or third, but just enough. Well, that's why we're in an outside lane to get into the final. Um, but when I reviewed our race times, I think from what I remember, our, we were the fastest boat on the water from the 1500 to the finish. And um, I knew our base was really fast, but we just were slow off the line. And so the entire week leading up to this final, we had been working on our our starts and i just thought like we have to get up off the start and that's all i was thinking at that time you know keep yeah, breathing yeah. Be from a good rhythm but get up and out <laughs> well here you are i mean you're going through the first 250 that's the the germans um the world champions going into that i think um and there's you over in lane one you know pretty much up there so uh it's a decent start that you had yeah, so um, I remember specifically thinking we're coming down off the start. I think we had the Dutch right next to us, and we were up on them, which was great. But beyond that, I couldn't really see. I just had the rate in front of me. And I think when we settled, we were around a 37. And I knew that was too high because, uh, you know, I'm not super experienced at sculling. We've got Amanda Elmore in the bow, who's, I think this is her first sculling race or her first sculling regatta. And so I remember specifically saying in the first 500, we got to come down. And I just mention it, and then Calmo is right behind me, and so she kind of s explained that to the rest of the crew. So we settled into a really nice room. What, what was it like, Ryan, with Megan Calmo behind you? Because she's quite a personality. I, I mean, as our, as our, I know all the women, but Megan's got quite a profile. Yeah, it was good. I think you know, like I said, we were in an Italian um, training camp before this, and uh, the boat wasn't clicking, and then. She was in bow, they moved her to three, and then all of a sudden the boat started to really take off. And she had been, she had lots of sculling experience. So it was nice to have her right behind me because she, she supported the rhythm. And um, I, you know, when we were in the boat, we were all really focused on making it go fast. And that just seems to be her MO whenever she hops in the boat. So it was good. Yeah. And <laughs> then. You're coming through in the second 500 metres, USA hitting the front. I mean, were you aware that you were not leading the world championship field at this time of the race? Um, I knew that it was between us and Germany, but I was really trying not to look outside the boat because I was steering, I was going, I was setting the rhythm. I, that was about max brain capacity for me, but I do remember <laughs> vividly Tracy Iser said, we are going to win this race as we came through this part right here, like just after the thousand. And I was like, okay, like we're going to do it. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. 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 I haven't got any shots of you looking out. I mean, you're straight down the boat. That's a, that's an awful lot to handle coming into the boat, but you're, you're leading the race. there, at sort of about um, two thirds of a length over the number four of, of Germany coming into the last 500 and there's Megan Calmo taking a look and you're still straight down the boat. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I looked out, you know, around this time and I think you ask any rower about their favorite races and there are portions of it that are very clear and seem like they kind of slowed down. And this was the part where I looked over and I thought, wow, we've got 30 strokes to the end and Germany. I know they're, I can see their bow ball here, but they just felt like they were miles away. And I just thought, you know, if you don't, if you don't mess this up, you're going to win. Yeah. And so that's what I'm really going through this bit. And there's you on the finish. Um, I mean, you said you didn't remember the finish of your race in 2013. Do you remember the finish of this race and how you felt? Well, I do remember the finish because um, Amanda Elmore caught a huge crab. And <laughs> I wasn't sure about it before or after the finish line. <laughs> So everybody, the crab, we felt the crab and we all looked to make sure we were over and we had, and what a sense of relief. You, you know, pre-Olympic year qualification on the line. We were one, we were in an outside lane, first time ever winning in the quad. Uh, 
stepping up into a seat that I wasn't originally supposed to be a part of. Like it was, it was a huge sense of relief. And I was just super proud because um, the U S doesn't necessarily have like the most decorated sculling history. And so to kind of put that marker up there, was awesome. It was, it was a phenomenal result. And, you know, it was really surprising, I guess, you know, maybe, I don't know if you were the least surprised of everyone on, on that lake, but I remember in commentary just going, you know, wow, that's an amazing sort of result for, for the US and that that put you in I guess or could have put you in quite a strong position for the uh, year before the Rio Olympics and selection or, or did it were you just all put back into the hat and then you had to kind of prove yourself all over again yeah it was just back into the hat we never rode that lineup again uh, and everybody was just in the mix and it was kind Why of do you think that was back to because um, some, some I think countries... that's... Sorry, carry yeah, sorry, on. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go on. That's just the U.S. system. We we mix it up constantly. I don't think when... I don't think we've ever kept a lineup the same from year to year. Um, and so I think, you, especially in 2016, it was kind of like you never knew where you stood. Every, every practice seemed like it was... Um, you know, could be selection. And so it was just keep, you were kind of always on your toes. You didn't really know. And so I think if you were to have taken out the same lineup consistently all year, I, you could have gotten complacent. I'm not sure. Mentally, that's really difficult to cope with, isn't it? You know, how, how do you get your head around that? Because, you know, you know, you know, you're a world championship, world champion from the previous year. You obviously are really, really focused. That Olympic selection must mean a lot to you, but you never know quite where the chips are going to fall each outing. Yeah, it makes it, I mean, it makes it really tough. I think it's easier to cope with the more experience you have with it um, and more you kind of understand what the process is going to be like. But yeah, that's what makes rowing challenging. That's what makes the Olympic year hard. <laughs> yeah. So um, when did it start to dawn on you that your place in the Olympic team was under threat? I know you made the, the Olympic uh, team as an alternate, as, as a kind of, um, you know, if anyone gets injured. But, you know, when did that happen and, and how did you cope with that? Um, I think that it's, it honestly started in earnest probably in the winter. I the volume started to come up in my training and I started to kind of crash in my performance. Um, and I never really figured out how to step back and restart from that. But I think that I was in it for selection right into the last few days. And so, you know, it didn't end up the way I wanted it to, but I think I gave it everything I had. I wouldn't have changed anything. And I think, even after being selected as the alternate, I continued to improve and I continued to get fast. So on the off chance somebody was hurt, I think people would have been happy to race with me. I felt personally like I was off of my game. So that's, I think, really hard to achieve when you're in that position, but I was really proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Did you travel to Rio at all, Olivia? Yep, I was there the whole time. I was essentially just like any other athlete. What was that experience like being an alternate and watching and supporting the team in effect? Um, I think that it's not, honestly, it's not too dissimilar from uh, racing. I think in many ways it's a little more enjoyable because you don't have the stress of performance. Um, I hopped in the quad a few days because uh, somebody was out. Um, so, you know, it was fun to row in the course. It was, and the Olympics are a, a cool experience for everyone, um, no matter what capacity you're in there. Um, would have loved to have raced, but I think just being there was a huge reward for all the, the work that had gone into that four year cycle. Yeah. So, so listening to you, you, you know, that's something that you, you, you're pleased that you did. And I guess that gave you, an appetite or, or did it give you an appetite had you decided after Rio that you would try for Tokyo or because I know you took a year out w was that a decision that took a while to come to you 
Um, no, it wasn't. At that point, I was like totally mentally and physically exhausted. I couldn't, I couldn't think about training at the training center any longer. I needed a break. Um, I also felt like I'd been working on the rowing part of my life for so long that I wanted to um, feel like I was good at something else. And so I started, I worked full time that year while continuing to train. Um, and then while I was working, I realized, you know what, I really need to get an MBA if I want to be successful in these, the fields that I'm interested in. Um, and I also really felt like I had an unfinished business with rowing. And so it kind of took a year to figure out that I wanted to come back. Um, and I thought, well, if I want to come back, the best place for me to be is, you know, Oxford or Cambridge because they have an MBA program and they have rowing. So I can get my foot in the door. I can see if this is something I want to continue with. And if it is, um, then that's a great avenue to kind of get myself back into shape and make myself, you know, a, a, a key player again, I guess you could say. But so no, you, afterwards, I was pretty defeated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you kind of had a you, you kind of had had an idea while you were rowing for Cambridge that you might be going back to the national team if you know the motivation was there. Yeah, and I also think that I wanted to prove myself that I could be fit and fast again in a boat, or at least feel that I had um, that had confidence in myself to make a team, to make a, a boat fast, and um, yeah, they gave me that in spades. So. So you were in you were in twenty it's twenty eighteen your boat race year, wasn't it? Twenty eighteen, yeah. So you got into the US national team the same year that you rode the boat race. And so you weren't training with the the women in the squad, but you still got into the national team. How did that come about? Yeah, so after the boat race ended, I thought, you know, I am like uh, I'm performing at a high level. My scores are competitive. I'm going to reach out to Tom and ask him if he'll have me back. And they welcomed me with open arms. They said, whenever you can get here, that's fine. Um, they gave me some training plan guidance, but I mixed that in with what Rob Baker had. And I continued to train, even though the boat race was over, um, out in the single out at Ely. And then I probably finished up in June. Um, and I had a summer project that I had to work on as part of the MBA, but I was able to do that while I trained. And I think I submitted my final project for the MBA the day that we left for Bulgaria. <laughs> wow. So the coaches were super nice. They said, come back whenever you want. I think I even took a few days on the back end of getting back to England to like, you know, go to their dentists, drop off my bags at home, that kind of stuff. So did, did Tom or the coaches notice that you were rowing any differently since you've been at Cambridge? Did they try and alter anything when you got back in the boat? Um, it seemed like it seemed like they thought I was rowing better than I had in the past. I, they're pretty, you know, compliments from them are hard to come by, which makes when they say them very rewarding. Um, yeah. I think. Um, said he liked how I was rowing that I had in group, which was really nice to hear because it's been something I've been working on for so long. Um, I don't remember him trying to make me row in a different style than I had when I returned. Yeah. So you mentioned compliments are hard to come by. I mean, is that – do you respond well to compliments? Do you think there they kind of ought to be more compliments in, in a, a training setup? in terms of, you know, the carrot versus the stick? Depends on who you're talking about. So I know lots of people who like to hear that you're not going fast enough and it could be better. And uh, that's definitely not me. Um, Self-motivated. I know what my goals are. So positive influence or positive reinforcement kind of person. But I think that, you know, they lose their luster when you hear them all the time. So I think just, you know, uh, when um, they are earned and deserved, they should be said. Yeah. And that's what that is. Yeah. Have, have you guys watched at all or caught that um, show on Michael Jordan on Netflix, The Last Dance? No, I haven't yet, but I really want to. Because it's interesting, the you know the competitiveness there. I was going to ask you for a comparison of of that and the women's team, but that's that's a question that I, I think I'll have to wait. 
Yeah, I got to watch the whole thing first, but I'll answer that question later. So in 2018, it wasn't just that they put you in the boat, that they put you in the boat in the stroke seat. Yeah, what a treat. <laughs> they gave me the keys. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I told Tom, I, I still tell him, you could put me in any seat. I really don't care. You could put me in uh, bow on starboard as long as I make the boat. I don't care. Put me anywhere. So I've got a picture here. Can you see that picture of you in this in the start? Yep. With Caitlin Garigi and I think your Cox just uh, in the yeah. final. You had a fantastic heat that World Championships. I seem to recall a very fast time. Yeah, smoking fast. Those were good conditions, um, and that boat was really quick. We were fast. So you're back in the stroke seat again. Back in the back in the team. What does it feel like to be on the start of an A final of the World Championships in a boat like that? Um, whew, uh, I've been trying to make the eight ever since I started rowing on the national team. So 2009 was my first under 23. So here I was uh, in the stroke seat, first time ever in the eight. I just felt like this is such a huge opportunity. Um, and one thing that I think that I add to a boat is I know when it's fast and I know it's not fast. And so um, I was communicating a lot with our coxswain um, in the, the weeks while we were at, in Bulgaria training. And I just, I knew this boat was fast. And so when you finally get the opportunity to like let loose, you're rested, you're tapered, you're strong and for it to connect, it's just really nice feeling. Um, so, and so how much were you, yeah. you know, how much were you a better athlete, you know, then in 2018 than you were in 2016 when you were trying out? I mean, were, were you much more of a complete package then sitting on the start? Yeah, 100% better. Different, totally different athlete. Um, fast, I was faster. I was a faster rower. I was mentally in a better headspace. I was confident, more mature. Um, yeah. What made, you me mentally, what made you mentally stronger, yeah. Olivia? Uh, I think that, mm, I think that stepping back away from the team and then trying to pursue something that I was, uh, not, you know, a world championship in, or a world champion in, um, getting into the, the job market, having to adapt to new things, learn new skills, um, yeah. then Cambridge just constantly challenging yourself in new ways, I think makes you better. So I wasn't challenging myself as much in the rowing aspect, I guess you could say in my two years off, but I was yeah. developing it to me, um, which was, I think, beneficial to my rowing. Okay. So off the start, the Australians led out, I think, going through the 500 metres. Um, but I guess you were pretty confident of the middle of your race. Yeah, I, I wish we were faster off the start because our, our heat was so fast off the start. And so... Um, yeah, I know in the middle of the race, we can really grind it out and we are fit. So, you know, you're just kind of waiting for the tide to turn and to start taking seats on the other boat. So here's you going through the, round about the 750 meter mark. Boat looks good, well set up. And the, you guys hit the front around about the thousand meter mark, I think. That's right. And I think once we start going, it doesn't stop. And it, that whole, from the 500 on, we were just trucking. And it never really crossed my mind um, that we couldn't win. Ever. Yeah. Nice and relaxed with 1,500 metres to go. And then almost a clear length over the Australians at the line. It's a nice margin. <laughs> And uh, nice celebrations too. What's your memory of that uh, line crossing? Yeah, that I mean, that was awesome. You, you don't get the opportunity when you're on the U.S. team too much to kind of have uh, like an underdog victory. And in 2017, they hadn't medaled. And so you're kind of coming into the regatta and people don't really know if you're what you guys used to be. And it was a culmination of a very big year. I got my MBA, did the boat race. And then to come top it all off with a win at the World Championships, like it doesn't really get much better than that. <laughs> I, I was going to, I, I meant to ask you, of course, 
the, the boat race how um how was the boat race for you as a, as an athlete i think you probably won in it by by quite a distance um yeah yeah i think it was seven lengths maybe yeah and was the buzz as great as as that crossing the line at the you could you compare the two crossing the line at the boat race and crossing the line at the world championships um no they're completely it's like a completely different sport it's not it's not in any way the same but they're both meaningful for different reasons i think we were a stronger crew than oxford i had a feeling like we were going to do very well and so racing it's not i'm i'm not racing oxford i'm racing myself how fast can i get this boat down the course and so you cross that line and it's not i beat up and so i mean like i said it's almost like a different sport both amazing in their own respect yeah yeah <laughs> Um, just one thing that occurred to me, I think, while while you were talking, do you have you had do you have any particular role models in in sport or in life that inspire you or help motivate you? Oh man, I it I that's like a very tough question because yeah. people who motivate you almost have no relationship with maybe the activities that you're in or. Um, the people that I, you know, the people that you're closest to, it's, it's hard to say. I don't think there's any one athlete where I think, oh, you're, you're perfect. And that's the kind of person I want to be, but I'll look at, you know, some people and I'll say, you know, I really like, I like your grit and I like your character or, or I like this person's yeah. skill. And so I want to be, uh, you know, I want to mesh all that together and do that. <laughs> I know that, um, uh, uh, you know, that maybe there are different aspects of your teammates that might help inspire you or motivate you as, as you, you know, the kind of squad you train with has got such depth. I mean, what about particular athletes in the team that you feel motivated or inspired by? Um, yeah, so look at the team. There are some women that I've been training with for over a decade uh, I think Emily Regan and I maybe were on the same U23 team, but I mean, everybody's good at different reasons. I could go down the eight and say why I think everybody's good. Um, I think the best thing about the whole squad together, one thing that everybody um, does really well and that I admire is they, they would rather die than not give their a hundred percent best effort at anything. And so yeah. that's something, I really admire and I look at when I look them do word tests or I watch them on the water. I just think like they're going, they're going there and I can go there too. And I'd say collectively as a group, but outside of that, I mean, I could look at, I could, I could go down the boat and say, you know, besides their effort level, what I like about at each athlete, I love how Felice Rose, she's so, you know, technical. She makes any small boat go fast. I love Emily Regan because she's a little bit crazy and she'll do, whatever it takes to get across the line. Caitlin, Caitlin is a different person in a race than she is on the, off the water. You know, she is like a hundred percent locked in. You talk to her outside of it. She could be all over the place, but when she's in the boat, you know, she's a hundred percent there. They've all got really great characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned there something about erg tests. Um, how's your, what's your 2k erg score? What's your P, PB or PR on that uh, 2k test? Are people allowed to say that? Or that, yeah, is that a think, thing? That, I think in lockdown you are. Um, let's see. I think my best was six thirty-seven. Um, and how how long ago did you do that? Um, I was in the twenty sixteen quad. I mean, it's not a distance that we test regularly. Uh, I would say all out two Ks. I've maybe done one or two on the national team. It's, wow! It's, yeah, yeah. What you, so? Do you prefer the two k or the five k test? Because some people have a liking for. Um, I prefer shorter. So <laughs> it's great, but it's a minute or test or maybe ten strokes. Those those are my uh, favorite ones. But yeah, no, I I struggle on the distance, but I've gotten so much better since training. It's incredible. 
Do you have do you have a particular training session that you find you know oh no not this session because I I really hate this session. Do you have a sort of bet noir of a training session? Um, yeah. So my least favorite training sessions are a hundred minute steady state ergs. <laughs> I never had to do another one of those. I would be very happy. <laughs> but I think I'm gonna have some of those in the future. A hundred minutes. Yeah. Four by twenty-five or two by fifty. Whoa! Your eyes start to glaze over, and you start to question, "Why am I here?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what about your favorite sessions? I mean, it sounds like the the shorter sprint pieces are something you really like doing. Yeah, my I'm actually my favorite row, and we maybe do it a couple times in the year, mo mostly in the summer, as we do two k, one k, five hundred. Um, step rate pieces increasing in rate. So the 2K will be, you know, 26 to 30. And then by the time you get to the 500, it's full up race Whoa. pace. And so it's as it gets shorter, the race, the rates come up. So it's like getting easier and harder all at the same time. But I think those are the, the pieces that like give me the biggest boost and makes me feel like we're in racing season. So those are the ones I really like. And um, how, how often in your training or your racing, have you ever, would you ever say that you've absolutely been in the zone where everything is just happening automatically, perfectly, you're riding at the top of your game? You know, it maybe hurts, but it doesn't because you're just right in there in the zone. How often have you had that kind of feeling in, in training or racing? Um, it happens very rarely, maybe... Uh, three or four times a year. I think that for it to not feel like it's very challenging and you're performing really well and you're really, really well, a lot of things have to come together and to be successful in training, you can't be there all the time or else you're not getting faster. Yeah. Yeah. Has it ever happened in a race? Yeah. The best races, that's when you're, it feels like nothing, right? That quad race in 2015, I didn't even feel like I was pulling that hard. And then you get to the end and you go, oh, maybe I did. I don't really remember. I just tried not to mess up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As somebody the other day off the start, I always have to remind myself, don't go too hard because, like, you can't feel anything when you're in the beginning of the race. You have too many other uh, factors influencing your perception of pain. And so you have to tell yourself that uh, you know, this is 2K and it's really short, but it's also really long, so you got to pace yourself. So, yeah, those are, like – three meters but you got to remember there's a yeah whole nother race yeah and Olivia I want to I want to take you back to to 2019 because um you came into that regatta as world champions um you ended up with a bronze medal um how do you see that result being third behind Australia and New Zealand no it's not it's not a good result um you know they were both very fast but we have the personnel to to win a world championship every year. And um, so that's my expectation whenever I go into regatta. I was like, we are here and we train to win all year and I want to win and I expect to win. So third is not, it wasn't good. I don't think anybody was pleased with it, but um, not like we needed any more motivation to train hard this year, but I think it definitely brought in the focus. And I think, um, if the Olympics had gone on, I still feel like we trained hard enough to put ourselves in a position to win. And I think, you know, 2018, we won the eight and the four. We've got the people. Um, that's not a question. Uh, it's just getting the pieces in the right place. And, yeah. um, you know, I think a lot of times before world championships, it doesn't really click till a few days that you're, you're there. And so even in 2018, I remember we kind of were struggling through training and then all of a sudden got to Bulgaria and it worked. And you're, I was at least hoping for that in 2019, and it, it didn't ever really happen, um, which was unfortunate. But I think that the effort was there, the people are there, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. And that's life. Yeah, and the women's race is a great event now. It's uh, It's got really close. I mean, you know, it's a, a fantastic event for the spectators to watch. Yeah, it is. It is great. And I, it is getting more and more competitive. I would say squad is certainly more competitive than previous squad, which was more competitive than the previous squad than that. But I also think that, uh, 
despite increased competition that we should always um, really aim to be towards the top. And I love that New Zealand and Australia picked up speed this quad and I like that they're getting faster and they're definitely pushing us to train hard. Um, and I hope we're doing the same for them. Yeah. So any idea when you're going to get back rowing again with your teammates? So um, I think the training center is going to open up this might be even open up today. So I think, you know, there is a group back down in Princeton training right now. Um, and so it, it, people are on the water. I'm personally here uh, at home. I'm trying to take a little more time to make sure I'm prepared and competitive and fit so that when I get back to the training center, I can really hit the ground running. Um, but for the most part, training centers and boathouses are open. They're just um, regulations in place to keep people healthy. So right now we're all in singles, um, making sure we wash our hands, wear masks when you're not um, in the boat, things like that. And I think it'll be a while still till we're in team boats, but I think that that's the right approach. And you can't really be too careful at this point. And honestly, time in the single makes you fast. So we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And um, by the sounds of you, you know, um, should Tokyo happen and, and you get there, as part of the USA, that's probably going to be your last Olympics. Yeah, but you know, now this is only three years away, right? No, I'm just kidding. I, I think it'll probably be done, but I'm not going to be, uh, I don't want to have a premature retirement. I think it, I'm going to let it happen organically. Right now, where I stand, it seems like that's going to be the end for me. But, um, you know, just take it day by day. Well, Olivia, it's been fantastic to share all those thoughts and, um, you know, for you to talk through your career and uh, so candidly as well. It's been been brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for calling. It's nice to see a new face. I, I stick with my bubble. You know, I don't see people outside of my bubble. Yeah. So it's nice to see someone new. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.